Welcome. Uh, welcome everyone to this live interview series episode. Uh, today we are honored to have with us uh, our special guest, Dr. Jan Figel, Special Envoy for the promotion of freedom of religion or belief outside the European Union. Uh, today we are actually not in our office, but in a very special place, the European Parliament. And uh, we are happy to um, uh, discuss some of the things that you, uh, some of your work and uh, some of the things that you have been doing uh, lately. I would like to remind you that uh, you can ask questions to Dr. Figel by leaving a comment below the video and uh, we would be happy to uh, pass them on to him. So, Dr. Figel, let's get into the interview. Uh, could you please share a little bit about yourself, your work and uh, your current responsibilities? Thank you, Francesco, for not only introducing but also inviting me and I wish a nice day and uh, all the best to all viewers. All friends of this topic. Um, yes, I am Jan Figel, uh, European Union Special Envoy for Promotion Freedom of Religion or Belief outside of the European Union, which is the first ever position created last year by the European Commission. I think this, this is the sign of importance, uh, urgency. We shall speak about it a bit later. I am a Slovak citizen, former member of the European Commission, I was in national and European politics for quite a long time and now I'm here under your invitation. I think that uh, uh, we live in a very special time. Many people think and speak about crisis and many people see that there are so many opportunities to, to make 21st century better time than 20th century. And I think that uh, religious issues uh, may be part of the decisive uh, answer or decisions on the uh, future of Europe, future of uh, the world. And fortunately, I'm glad that European Union has a role to play in this. Thank you. And uh, we are too. We were very pleased to learn about the, your appointment as first special envoy. Uh, we thought, uh, among with others, that this was a position that was actually, uh, that was actually missing. Um, I have had the pleasure to listen to, one of, uh, to your keynote speech at the uh, recent uh, uh, annual Law and Religion Symposium at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Um, you touched on very important points, and, uh, and I would like to uh, discuss some of those with you for the benefits of those who did not have the chance to hear it. Let's start with the following. You said, who does not understand religion, especially abuse of religion, cannot understand what is going on in the world today. Uh, can you explain why? Yes, on one side, the religions are important because um, according many serious uh, data or studies, the majority, overwhelming majority of the world population claims uh, religious affiliation. So we are not speaking about something minor or uh, partial. It's a major issue in the today's world and of course in, in the world history. Secondly, uh, ignorance or lack of knowledge, lack of understanding is one of the problems of our time. And lack of knowledge of religions, religious differences, religious meaning or importance in life of people and nations is also part of the growing problem because we see frequently in media but also in our societies how illiterate people, whether young or less young, are on the religious uh, issues. And actually uh, what's going on in some regions of the world are not uh, religious clashes or, or fights. Uh, this is fight uh, usually taken by those who claim ideology uh, superiority, want to achieve supremacy over the others and it's a quest for political power. This is, for example, the so-called Islamic State is not a religion. It's a, it is a political organization aimed to um, um, impose ideology of ISIS on the territories they besieged in different countries of the Middle East. So those who do not understand religion cannot understand what's going on, even why it's going on, and then cannot bring reasonable solutions. And then we have even, even bigger problems growing from the improper decisions or uh, wrong policies. So education plays a major role, and we will, uh, we will touch on that uh, uh, later on. Uh, you often say that freedom of religion belief is the litmus test of all human rights. Uh, why is this so? 
I think it's a very crucial, special uh, human right, fundamental right, um, enshrined in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also in other uh, texts. It's so important uh, that uh, it's, uh, first of all, it's not only freedom of religion, it's freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom to believe or not to believe, a freedom of conviction. So it's much broader than just uh, religious uh, freedom. Uh, secondly, with this uh, uh, definition, it's linked to human dignity, and human dignity is the first value, which we declare as the most important among on the list of human rights, uh, which is so important to all and everywhere. Human dignity. Uh, makes uh, um, you know our holders of um, equality and rights connected to human dignity, not given by the states but respected by states. Uh, secondly, this right, uh, freedom of religion, is um, implemented, is lived through individual or collective manner manners. So it can be uh, linked to individual rights and collective rights. Further on, uh, it is an um, uh, expanding right because it's linked to uh, right to uh, manifest, to express freedom of expression, freedom to assembly, freedom to associate. And from this point of view, I can say, and that's the, the answer to your question, in countries or in societies where freedom of religion is disregarded, civil or political freedoms are disrespected as well. Where freedom of religion is respected, we see other freedoms flourishing. Thank you. This brings me to, this, uh, to the question about your mandate. Uh, so your mandate is to promote uh, freedom of religion belief uh, outside of the European Union. So in the course of your uh, mandate and, uh, and, and travel, um, what, what, is your, um, what is your assessment of the status of freedom of religion belief internationally? The thing is, many, many Europeans, especially in well-established democracies, uh, yeah. take it for granted. Uh, but uh, there are areas in the world where freedom of religion belief does not exist. It's far, so what, uh, it's far from granted, what, yes. what is your take? The picture is very, very colorful and uh, rather negative. In more concrete terms, it means uh, freedom of religion or belief is under strong or high restrictions first and secondly tendency is negative according to many surveys uh, uh, reports majority of all population live in countries where uh, high or very high restrictions on freedom of religion or belief are imposed and the tendency means that there is growing either governmental or non-governmental oppression on these rights we see four levels of um, restrictions or, or problems. It's intolerance, uh, discrimination, persecution for faith and even genocide. This is not because I say it, but because that's the, these are the facts in the world today. And um, we should do much more uh, for, for promotion, which means for human dignity promotion and uh, culture of human rights, because this is litmus test. The picture is uh, really uh, very diverse, starting from European neighborhood, where Middle East means also genocidal situations. It was noted and criticized by European Parliament, Council of Europe, by US Congress, uh, British Parliament, uh, Australian Parliament, that, that uh, ISIS mass atrocities uh, constitute genocide in our times. Uh, there are countries where uh, blasphemy laws or anti-conversion legislation uh, threatens not only freedom but living of, of people, uh, whether we speak about Middle East, North Africa or um, Southeast Asia. Um, there are non-governmental actors which are persecuting uh, religious or ethnic minorities, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban and many other uh, different uh, terrorist uh, organizations. So uh, what I say is that um, Tendency uh, is negative and situation also uh, uh, very painful. Europe, European Union, but also institutions like United Nations, Democratic 
countries need to step up in their struggle and support for freedom of religion. Thank you for sharing this. I mean, uh, it is clear that a lot of people do not are not aware of, uh, of all of this. But is there anything good that is happening to Forb internationally? Have you seen any good practice or any good experience in your in, in your in your mandate? Yeah, I am not a man of negative messages, basically. And secondly, I also uh, want to assure that my nomination here, um, our work is is a good signal that the European Union wants to pay more attention than it, it, it did. In recent years, a lot has happened actually in these premises. For example, in this European Parliament, there is first time ever an institutionalized group dealing with uh, freedom of religion. It's a uh, European Parliament intergroup on FORP and religious tolerance. Uh, European uh, uh, member states, 28 countries, adopted in June 2013 uh, guidelines on FORP promotion. I'm sorry for this abbreviation, we use it basically for freedom of religion and belief. So there is kind of common uh, toolbox for 28 countries, their diplomacies and European External Action Service to deal with the persecuted people, with individual cases, with the, the legislations or, or problems in our partner countries. Uh, last not least, my nomination uh, shows that there is a way how to improve. For example, since last year we had uh, first time in European Development Days debate with uh, faith-based actors. If we don't include faith-based actors or leaders into our realities, how can we achieve significant changes if religion in that part of the world is so significant or important? Religious leaders have, to have a say, have a authority, many times they have big influence uh, in, in their countries and they should be invited to, for example, support sustainable development, reconciliation, peace processes. Um, secondly, we have established first time in 25 years Lorenzo Natali Media Prize for uh, Journalism in FORP for amateur and professional journalists who write stories about cases of persecution or interface dialogue and cooperation. Much more can be done and I did of course in my, my one year something. We have started processes in Sudan, in Iraq, in Jordan, uh, I visited Morocco, United Arab Emirates. Uh, in many countries uh, we have uh, uh, started something what can bring fruits in coming years. These are not short-term issues. Usually we need you know, to work long and hard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Figa. Um, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to remind the viewers that uh, you are watching the live uh, interview series episode with Dr. Jan Figel, the Special Envoy for the Promotion of uh, Freedom of Religion and Belief outside of the European Union. And uh, we are well into the interview, but uh, feel free to ask questions and leave them uh, uh, with a comment and uh, they will be passed to us and uh, we will ask them to Dr. Figel. Uh, Dr. Figel, in your speech, you said that the world is changing through technology, migration, religious demography, etc. And then you asked, uh, is this a promise, meaning is this a positive thing or rather a threat? Uh, what, is your, what is your take? My, yeah, my point was kind of appeal that we have a say on the answer. We have influence on the two tendencies, whether changing the world is a problematic feature or, or positive. It depends what is winning, what, what, we, what we support, what will prevail. And I spoke and I speak, this is my, my, my conviction about common good versus ideologies of superiority, superiority based on nation, on race, on religion, on ethnicity, because our history is full of examples. And common good is about peace, justice, human dignity, solidarity, humanity or brotherhood for all. I'm not using empty terms, but very important principles. And uh, everybody uh, has uh, some influence. The rate of our responsibility depends on the rate of our influence, individually and collectively. Uh, this is true for, for citizens, this is true for political parties, for states, for communities and societies. I'm not pessimist. I, I wouldn't uh, also uh, uh, kind of preach empty optimism, empty optimism, 
But what we need is a committed people who know, who understand, who are courageous enough to deal with the problems of our time. My father, my grandfather, many people around Europe would love to have our problems. Secondly, we can help not only to solve domestic problems in Europe, but around in Middle East and in the world. Europe has a potential to help. Thank you. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned responsibility and um, you made it clear that everyone has a role to play. Uh, citizens, academics, human yes. rights activists, politicians. Uh, what would you tell a teenager who is watching this uh, interview right now? Um, how could he or she make a difference mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, in his daily life? And, uh, and since we are inside the European Parliament, what would you tell to a politician? Um, I like to uh, stress that uh, the evil has allies and uh, I'm sad when I see allies of evil among young people. Uh, ignorance, indifference or fear. So my, my message to young people is not to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Study, learn, uh, because you will, you will uh, um, see the world which is even more uh, diverse than it is now. And um, don't be apathetic. Um, youth means future. Young people are holders of future. They, they actually hold our destiny in hands because they are coming to power, to responsibility, to public life, to their professions. Um, so um, we need to work with young people, uh, not only for young people, but with young people. It is about dialogue. It is about their engagement. Uh, I'd like to invite them to be active, to be present. This is their Europe, their time, their future and our common as well. Politicians, even more uh, as holders of power, they should use their potential, their uh, responsibility for you know, support of common good. Instead of teaching or, or claiming that my country first or you know, my, my nation first, we need to speak about common ground, common good common interests and then we, through this we get to common victory and common future. Um, as I said before, my father or generations before, if I look to Europe, would love to have uh, our opportunity to be in united and free on united and free continent. Now we have it, so we shouldn't be full of skepsis uh, or passivity, but active, knowledgeable and responsible. And this is the best answer, the best gift, gift to ourselves, but also to the world around. Thank you. These were excellent, uh, excellent invitations. Uh, let's see what uh, what questions are being uh, are being asked. Um, so, Paula, Paula asks, what is your assessment on the implementation of the EU guidelines on the promotion and protection of freedom of religion and belief? Are those who are actually in need of protection aware they have the EU delegations on their side? Uh, we have over 130 delegations and uh, it's good that the instrument or tool is now in these delegations and in the European External Action Service. But uh, I think what is needed is more knowledge and more, more practice over these uh, uh, guidelines because many times they are unknown or unused for the cases in uh, different countries. So the momentum comes now after three years uh, to not only reassess, but to do even more with European Parliament and, and let's say special envoy or several countries having special ambassadors at large to deal with FORP agenda uh, regularly, professionally, uh, actively, and of course successfully for the benefit of people in need. Thank you. Uh, Anna is asking, uh, you visited Sudan recently, what was your takeaway from that visit? This was one of the most uh, interesting visits I, I had, because if I say a one-off, I mean in my political life when I was either Slovak or European uh, representative, European Union commissioner for example. I was first time in Sudan, so a bit unknown country for practical political uh, negotiations. But this visit was so, so good, uh, so constructive that 
I feel I should come back. I was reinvited by Sudanese authorities. We have helped to move or to start some changes, some processes. Uh, what probably was the most um, surprising and positive was a release uh, of two groups of people from prison. I helped through different channels and then finally through the visit in Sudan, Khartoum, uh, to, to help to get to freedom uh, the group of Peter Yashek, Czech activist uh, who was in prison and sentenced for 24 years in Sudan. And he had also um, collaborators from Sudan, Sudanese, who got 12 years uh, of jail. They are now free. And then uh, in uh, August, even more uh, sensitive case happened when uh, Professor Mudawi was released and he was under the threat of uh, death sentence as human rights uh, defender, together with five activists. I, I was the first foreigner politician who visited uh, Professor Ibrahim Mudawi in his uh, uh, prison, which was a sign of, you know, very open and uh, kind of um, willing approach from the Sudanese government because they didn't do it before and uh, later on in the you know this uh, process uh, what happened was a very surprising positive and encouraging sign that um, freedom to this man uh, is given and I hope this will not be kind of uh, exceptional case but rather tendency in the country where a lot of problems are still very visible uh, in terms of human rights or freedom of religion or inter-community relations. Uh, but Sudan for me was a case study showing that not preaching and teaching but working together with serious partners can make a difference and if we continue, if we invest into such cooperation, I think we can help many more people in Sudan and, and also in other countries. Thank you. Uh, Joshua is asking, as politics and cultures across the world become increasingly more secular, what is the best way to protect and fortify religious freedom and its role in society? Um, sacral, secular is not a problem. Uh, problem comes when uh, secular uh, becomes kind of um, imposition over plurality. What we need for freedom of religion to grow, to deliver uh, good fruits for daily living of people, is uh, a secular state which is fair which is uh, not imposing its, uh, you know, uh, ideology, secularism, which is not, you know, closing the space for uh, different religions and communities, but defining space for plurality. And in that case, such state is a blessing for different religions. It's kind of fair referee on a pitch where we live, where we move. Um, when secularism is false, it usually takes place of religions, tries to replace, to wi wipe out uh, religious freedoms. Uh, so from this point of view, uh, true, fair, uh, secular state is very important expression of civil society and civil state, which means state based on citizenship and equality for all not on ethnicity or on religion. This is, thank you, this is uh, uh, close to the, to the previous uh, question, uh, but as a slightly different angle. Um, Hannah is asking, how would you respond to people who worry that more freedom of religion or belief for other people means less freedom for them? Is there a balance? There is always. Uh, uh, balance is always important in terms of uh, my freedom ends where your freedom starts. So uh, together we can enjoy freedoms or together we can fight. And freedom uh, of uh, uh, religion, free freedom of conviction, which is part of the uh, human freedoms and uh, fundamental rights, 
can be enjoyed by all and the universality of, of this principle, universality of, of the whole list is an invitation to recognize that uh, these freedoms belong to all, not only to traditional, not only to majority uh, communities, but to all. Uh, actually what we need is to, to learn how to live in freedom. And living in freedom is always possible, lasting, sustainable, only with responsibility. So I am responsible for my freedom and for our freedom together, with you, with many, with all. If we don't share this responsibility, if we don't care for responsibility, our freedom will be lost, sooner or later. Thank you. I have a question from, from Maria. Maria is asking, how can we share this message of freedom to those who do not understand religion and its role? How have you handled this in the past? We have to learn. Uh, we have to learn how to live in complexity, in openness, in uh, freedom, in a very diverse world. Uh, I want to stress that there is freedom to believe and not to believe or to change belief. So it doesn't mean that there is kind of uh, promotion for religions against non-religions or because um, human dignity is based on freedom in full sense. And um, from this point of view, we, we, have to, we have to learn a lot. Uh, I like to mention human dignity because this is, this is something what, uh, what should unite all humanists, uh, whether they are secular, non-believing or religious, believing humanists. Because if human dignity for us, for these humanists who claim they are humanists, is really the first value, they should meet from different angles at the same you know, point. Uh, if that's not the case, the problem is not human dignity, but lack of credibility of our or theirs or anybody's humanism. So um, I think that um, once we embrace human dignity as the first value as it is defined in European Charter of Fundamental Rights or Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, whether we come from um, a scientific or uh, religious, traditional, different cultural angles, we should embrace this first value because it's important for me, for you, for everybody. Thank you. Um, I see a question is coming. Um, I would really like to take this question uh, if it's coming soon. Adam. But. But um, let me see. No, it's, it's not coming. Well, any final comment or remark uh, before before we uh, conclude this interview? I already mentioned uh, these allies of um, evil. Uh, 20th century is full of lessons, especially in Europe. And uh, when people in their you know communities tend to neglect not to be interested, not to know, to close down. Uh, we uh, face uh, growing tendencies of problems or, or clashes. And uh, I uh, don't accept the, the line or the prophecy of clash of civilizations. No, we need more civilizations. We need civilized world. We need to work for civilization. But what is really uh, Potentially and, and possibly coming is clash of um, uh, ignorances. If we don't care, if we don't know, and therefore, I'm grateful for this interview. I'm grateful for your work here in in Brussels for communication on importance of the topic, which is not material, but decisive for human dignity, for human relations, for cultures to live together, for the world to live in unity and diversity. And here I would like to invite everybody because we all have responsibility for such world, not as a dream, but as a reality to come. And with this invitation, we can, uh, we can close this, uh, this interview. Thank you very much, Dr. Figel, for your time. 
thank you for your work, uh, for your word of wisdom today, which we'll uh, take in our work. And uh, thank you for watching us. And uh, we'll uh, stay informed uh, for our upcoming uh, live interviews and, uh, and our activities. Thank you very much. Thank you all. All the best.